And we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. at uh, Swedish uh, uh, Neuroscience Institute. And it is my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Tony Wong. Tony is going to speak to us this morning on focused ultrasound for movement disorders. Uh, this is the latest in our continuing series of uh, John Jane visiting lectureships. Uh, Tony is one of the many wonderful legacies of Dr. Jane coming to us from UVA and uh, subsequently a fellowship uh, at UCLA. Um, we are delighted to have Tony uh, join our group two years ago. Um, joining in the middle of the pandemic is a bit of a challenge. Tony has been more than up to the challenge and we are pleased to have him here this morning to give an update on focused ultrasound for movement disorders. Tony, please. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I just want to extend a thanks to uh, SSF here for asking me to speak here. Uh, very honored to be here talking about uh, focused ultrasound. And as Dr. McDougall mentioned, uh, you know, being from UVA myself, uh, giving this lecture in Dr. Jane's name carries uh, extra special meaning. Uh, one disclosure of note, uh, in the past I have done uh, consultancy work for Insight Tech. They are the company that makes the ultrasound device. So what is the fuss with focused ultrasound? Um, many of you may have heard of this technology recently in the news. Uh, several years ago, it got FDA approval to treat uh, essential tremor through unilateral focused ultrasound thalamotomy. And this generated a lot of fanfare, even in kind of the, the general media. I have an excerpt, excerpt from the Wall Street Journal here on the right detailing how now brain surgery can be performed without an incision or a drill in the skull. And in the subsequent years, focused ultrasound has since uh, gained additional uh, indications. It's been approved for uh, thalamotomy for tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. And then a few years later, it received FDA approval for uh, unilateral pallidotomy, focused ultrasound pallidotomy for treatment of other symptoms of Parkinson's disease such as rigidity and dyskinesia and motor fluctuation. Um, before we talk about focused ultrasound as it pertains to today's developments, I always find it helpful to look back into the history because when you look back, it, always, it often informs you of, of where you're going. And it turns out with focused ultrasound, you know, in many ways, it's the new kid on the block, but focused ultrasound has a very rich history in the neurosurgical uh, history. Uh, we look back and you can see in the 1950s, people were using focused ultrasound. Um, you know, this was published in a very reputable journal, Science. Uh, here we have the Fry brothers. They were a pioneering group of researchers out of the University of Iowa. And they demonstrated that you could make very targeted focal lesions in brain with, foc with ultrasound. And here they uh, demonstrate that you can make a tiny discrete lesion, and here they have a cat brain without any damage to the surrounding brain. And they go on to say in their, their paper, the ultrasonic method of producing localized selective lesions in the central nervous system constitutes a unique and potent tool for experimental neurological and neurosurgical applications. The technique is currently being used in this laboratory in a variety of neurological studies. And no doubt that's what we see uh, in the following years. We see ultrasound being used in a variety of different neurosurgical and neurological applications, including movement disorders. So here we have the Fry brothers reporting their early experience about using focused ultrasound to treat uh, movement disorders. This was here published in the JNS. We have a uh, picture of their schematic uh, here in the center with this kind of uh, four array uh, apparatus. That's the ultrasound transducer itself. At the uh, bottom, you see this kind of silver bowl. The silver bowl has a hole cut out in the bottom, which rests on the exposed kind of a human brain with, with the skull removed. 
you have two pipes here that are piping in, kind of circulating uh, degas saline that act as a transducer medium. And so they treated a total of 12 patients, uh, primarily with tremor and rigidity. 11 of these patients were what we would call Parkinsonian, and one of them was a uh, cerebral palsy patient with spastic quadriplegia. They had some mixed results, uh, but nonetheless, that did kind of lay the framework for other people to look at using ultrasound for other neurologic conditions. And here we have uh, the Pittsburgh group reporting their experience in using focused ultrasound for psychosurgery. So this was published in the predecessor of what became JAMA Neurology. We see that uh, here is their uh, cartoon schematic of the ultrasound device. Uh, they do a bicoronal incision. They have two pre-coronal uh, burr holes, which allow for the transducer to penetrate into the brain tissue. Uh, they treated 25 patients with uh, chronic pain, and uh, they did report some promising initial results. However, none of them were really sustained. They said everybody had initial pain relief. However, at one year, only two patients were pain-free. They did post-mortem histological analysis, and they found that nine patients had you know, white matter necrosis in the presumed area of the ultrasound uh, sonication, while 16 had no obvious histological changes. Um, Perhaps you can see one of the limitations of focused ultrasound in this cartoon in that you need to make a craniotomy or you, know, you need to remove the skull in order to have ultrasound go into the brain. And that's certainly what we see in that uh, earlier slide that I showed you. And so that's one of the reasons amongst many that ultrasound in its original iteration never caught on. One, you need to remove the skull. So there was thought, well, if you remove the skull, you're already kind of doing the surgery anyways. Why introduce this extra step? Additionally, there were at, uh, issues with accuracy. And then insofar as movement disorders, there was a general decline in lesioning. Uh, levodopa got introduced, and that just kind of decreased the number of lesioning Lesioning kind of made a comeback maybe in the late 80s, early 90s. However, DBS was coming on the scene then, and you saw a further decrease in lesioning. Um, it's interesting that uh, Lars Laxell, uh, those of you who are in the neurosurgical field know that name very well, uh, he was actually very interested in using focused ultrasound for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. He even developed a special frame and a transducer but uh, because of these reasons, he found that it was just not ideally suited. So he pivoted from focused ultrasound to ionizing radiation, which eventually paved the way for his development of the gamma knife, which has since been adopted uh, in many neurosurgical applications, neuro-oncology, vascular, and to some extent, even movement disorders. But you know, in its original iteration, ultrasound never really caught on, so it was just kind of this forgotten stepchild, if you will, just kind of tucked away in the corner for, for decades. That was up until the early 2000s when there were advances in the kind of the, I'll say, the physics side of how ultrasound is delivered. So um, basically, the skull is this large barrier to allowing ultrasound energy to penetrate into the brain tissue. However, there were technological advances which allowed for transcranial delivery, that is, you know, through the skull without the need for a craniotomy. Uh, basically, the skull distorts ultrasound waves, and there was developments in phase, uh, uh, wave phase correction algorithms to adjust for this distortion. And then in addition to that, there were uh, developments in imaging itself. So MRI has since been developed since uh, the original ultrasound, so which increases the accuracy. In addition to MRI, MR thermography allows for real-time temperature monitoring. So the combination of this technology now being able to be delivered through the skull as well as being monitored in real time kind of ushered in the, the current era of focused ultrasound. And we can see that uh, beginning in the early 2000 teens, mid 2000 teens, where there were three small open label trials investigating focused ultrasound for essential tremor. So 
You have the, uh, the group out in Canada here in the upper left publishing in uh, Lancet Neurology. You have the UVA group uh, publishing here in the New England Journal, and then the Korean group uh, publishing here in JNNP. And so these were three small, open, uh, non-blinded trials. Uh, they had anywhere between four and 15 patients. However, that demonstrated promising results with uh, minimal side effects with regards to focused ultrasound thalamotomy. And that then paved the way a couple years later for a multi-center randomized uh, double-blind controlled trial for focused ultrasound uh, thalamotomy for a central tremor. And so what happened is, you know, patients would come to the treatment center, they would get their head shaved, they would have the stereotactic frame placed, they would go into the MRI scanner, you know, get prepared, and then right before we're about to start the procedure, uh, we'd open up an envelope that would either say treatment or sham. So patients would be shammed or randomized to either a sham treatment or a real treatment. The MRI would make sounds and whatnot and take pictures if, uh, if they were randomized to sham. The patients were blinded to this themselves. Uh, we had uh, independent raters that objectively measured tremor and they themselves were also blinded to whether or not the patient received or didn't receive the treatment. And so there were a total of 76 patients that were randomized, uh, 56 ended up going to the treatment arm, 20 ended up going to the sham arm. And you can see that uh, in terms of the primary outcome, which was a CRST tremor score at three months, that the folks who were randomized to treatment had on average uh, a 47% improvement in their uh, tremor score on their dominant hand. The sham folks on average netted an improvement of essentially zero. It was 0.1%. Um, eventually, uh, the vast majority of the patients that were shammed, 20 of them, of those 20, 19 elected to then pursue the treatment in the open label uh, period. You might notice that uh, after three months, at uh, 12 months, there's a, perhaps a little bit of tremor recurrence. And I, I think that does, you know, beg a very legitimate and reasonable question, you know, wh what are the long-term outcomes with this procedure? And so this was looked at a couple years ago, uh, published in Neurology here. This looked at the three-year follow-up of these original 76 patients that were treated. Uh, for what it's worth, at, at three years um, of the original 76, only 52 of the patients were able to uh, have full data for three years. When you look at the hand tremor motor score improvement at 36 months, you do still see a significant improvement from baseline. Perhaps it's not as you know, uh, robust as uh, six months or 12 months. Um, at 36 months, they report a 53% tremor uh, improvement. And this translates into significant improvement in both disability as well as quality of life. However, you, know, you, you can't ignore the fact that uh, 24 patients of their initial 76 are missing. I, I don't think that can just be kind of glossed over. There's a couple ways to look at that. You could, one, assume that everyone who dropped out returned to their pre-focused ultrasound tremor baseline, or you could just carry forth their last data point and assume that's their same data point for the three-year follow-up. If you do that the first way, assuming everyone returned to their baseline, you net a tremor improvement of 38%. If you do it the second way, you net a tremor improvement of 50%. So in general, when I tell patients for uh, focused ultrasound counseling in terms of tremor reduction, in terms of an object objective measure, we will tell patients anywhere from 50 to 80% tremor reduction. In terms of side effects, there are uh, several very uh, characteristic side effects that happen after focused ultrasound thalamotomy. Um, most commonly, we'll see paresthesias in the hand. So if we treat the right hand, you'll see paresthesias in the fingers or thumbs. Sometimes you can see uh, numbness and tingling in the lip or tongue contralateral to the lesion. And this is because, recall, the, the VIM thalamus is immediately anterior to the sensory thalamus. And so when you make this lesion, there's a very predictable amount of swelling that happens after the ultrasound ablation. That sets in a couple days after the procedure, peaks maybe around a week, and around two weeks starts to round the corner and resolve. And so as that 
swelling takes place, you'll very predictably see these uh, side effects of numbness and tingling. In addition, a very common side effect that we see is ataxia and imbalance, some sort of gait disturbance. Uh, I tell patients that these types of side effects are almost expected after ultrasound, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30%, which you know, if you ask me is, is not a small number, we'll see these side effects uh, pop up. Uh, however, uh, most of them do get better as that perilesional edema does uh, resolve. With that said, there are um, permanent side effects that can be reported anywhere from 5 to 15%, one to two years out. We'll report some level of perhaps numbness, tingling, or subjective gait imbalance. Now, the vast majority of these side effects, uh, in, in my experience, are, are very minor in scope. Uh, be that as it may, at the end of the day, you are ablating brain tissue, you are burning brain, so there is the real possibility of you know, permanent disabling side effects, which in the most serious case would be something like limb weakness resulting in gait balance, walking difficulty. The risk of that is, is probably around one to less than 1%. Looking at uh, even longer data, uh, recently they published a five-year uh, clinical results for these original 76 patients. Um, you can see that at 60 months or five years, the tremor reduction is still you know, quite marked compared to pre-op. However, you do see that this is you know, perhaps wearing off. And, and this speaks to the fact that you know, focused ultrasound and for that matter, DBS, none of these procedures are cures for a central tremor. As, as folks age, it's very uh, conceivable and, and, and to some extent expected that their tremor would recur or progress. Uh, we looked at the durability um, of the patients that we treated at UVA. Uh, take this for, you know, what it's worth. This is a patient reported uh, outcome and a single center. Uh, we treated just under 100 patients between 2011 and 2019. Of these 100 patients, 85 of the patients were able to be reached. Average follow-up was three years. Um, in their self-reported tremor improvement, folks reported a 66 on average percent tremor improvement. And just under three-fourths of the procedure, uh, three-fourths of the participants reported meaningful clinical benefit. However, you know, with that said, um, you know, this is a non-adjustable procedure unlike DBS, so it, it, it has been noted that the tremor can come back. And so what do you do about that? Um, we get a lot of questions about focused ultrasound. You know, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, if I have this procedure, does this burn any sort of bridge in the future? Can I not get DBS? Can I not get focused ultrasound again? And the answer to both those questions is no. Um, having focused ultrasound doesn't preclude you uh, from pursuing that treatment again if it's needed or DBS. So we reported a, a case several years ago of a, a gentleman who was treated uh, with focused ultrasound, had initial uh, very good tremor um, benefit, tremor abolition. However, eventually the tremor did recur to its pre-ultrasound baseline. Uh, we then indicated him for deep, deep brain stimulation and he had sustained tremor benefit. Um, on the right, this is a, a case report from the Cornell group detailing their experience with repeat focused ultrasound treatment in which uh, they used MR tractography to target the DRT tract to uh, more effectively uh, do their repeat focused ultrasound treatment. And so how does uh, focused ultrasound compare to the other surgical or interventional procedures we have to offer uh, for ET. Uh, There's a little bit of a busy slide. Uh, for, uh, for the interest of brevity, uh, I'm not going to necessarily highlight our radio frequency uh, ablation that much. I'm going to talk about ultrasound as it compares to DBS as well as gamma knife thalamotomy. Uh, DBS, uh, to be clear, in many ways still represents the gold standard of uh, movement disorder surgery. Uh, it has been around the longest. It has the most clinical data supporting its efficacy as well as its durability. Uh, one of the main benefits of DBS is its adjustability, right? As I mentioned earlier, um, none of these treatments are cures for essential tremor. So as, you're tr as you age, your tremor could come back to some degree or progress. And with DBS, um, if that happens, 
you know, you can make a relatively easy maneuver by reprogramming, increasing the stimulation to, a, to address any sort of recurrent tremor. Um, that, that's very appealing for a lot of patients. Um, additionally, the adjustability uh, is beneficial in another kind of realm as it relates to stimulation-related side effects. I mentioned earlier with ultrasound that when you make this ultrasound lesion and there's perilesional edema that you might get side effects such as numbness, tingling, you know, dysarthria, balance issues. When you turn on the electricity for DBS, the electricity can spread to these other areas and create very similar side effects. Uh, with DBS, management of those side effects is much easier. You know, worse comes to worse, you could turn the device off or, or you know, more realistically, you can make programming changes, especially with the directional devices these days to steer electricity away from these problem areas and just focus on tremor. So the adjustability is, is very nice and a very appealing for DBS. Um, we see a lot of patients in clinic who, who come to us interested in focused ultrasound. They don't really necessarily know that much about DBS. We talk to them about both, and then they come away actually more interested in DBS primarily because of this reason, the, the adjustability, okay? For Neurologic complication here, I have DBS listed as lowest, and, and to be clear, I, I'm talking about neurologic complications related to the treatment at the thalamus itself. So these would be side effects of numbness, tingling, dysarthria, balance difficulties. And the reason that's listed as lowest is that it's adjustable. If you turn on electricity and develop any sort of um, stimulation-related side effect, you can make some, some moves to address that. When you contrast that to focused ultrasound, what I tell patients with, uh, who are interested in focused ultrasound is that you, I'll tell them you will develop these side effects more than likely. However, what happens is over time, as the swelling reduces, a lot of these side effects will get better and some of them will probably just go away. With that said, there's not really any active treatment I can do to manage those side effects other than just tell patients to wait it out. So that's a distinct disadvantage of focused ultrasound. Additionally, when you think about focused ultrasound's lack of adjustability, um, that does come into play when you think about long-term uh, results. So you know, you think in three, five years down the line, if you have some sort of tremor recurrence, yes, with ultrasound, you can have ultrasound done again, or you can elect to have DBS. However, you know, you have to have a whole separate procedure. It's not like DBS where you can just have a little quick reprogramming session. Um, time course to clinical benefit is something that I, I feel a lot of patients and perhaps referring doctors might not be too keen or, 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 or thinking about. Um, with focused ultrasound, you come into the, the treatment center the procedure takes about two to three hours, and then afterwards, the tremor is immediately better. Uh, with DBS, how I was trained, how we do it here, and how a lot of places do it is they break it up into multiple stages. So you'll come in, you'll have the electrode place. A week or two later, you'll have the lead extensions and the battery place. Maybe a week or two later, you'll have the device turned on. So it's not as if you come in, have the electrode place, and you have immediate tremor benefit. Um, you know, DBS has a lot of advantages, no doubt. Uh, however, there are some disadvantages compared to focused ultrasound in that one, it's, it's a, what we would call traditional surgery. You have to have an incision, you have to have a burr hole, you have to have hardware implanted in you. And with uh, hardware implantation, there is a risk for infection. A lot of the folks who come forth for these procedures tend to be a little bit older. They might have a little bit more, you know, medical comorbidities, perhaps suboptimally controlled diabetes, perhaps they're on some sort of immunomodulator for you know, a transplant or rheumatoid arthritis or what have you. And so I, I think the infection risk is not a you know, insignificant thing. Uh, when you compare that with focused ultrasound, this is an incisionless procedure. Um, you know, we don't have to cut you open or, or drill a hole in the skull or plant, implant any hardware. And so, the infectious risk is essentially nil. I have, knock on wood, yet to see anyone get infected from the, the pin sites on the frame itself. Um, uh, 
DBS, uh, in the first column here, I have bilateral treatments, and that's, you know, that, that's a long been a, a large advantage with DBS. Because of DBS and the nature through how it works, being a non-lesional uh, treatment option has long been thought of as being much more safe to treat bilateral symptoms. So that is the treating the left thalamus and the right thalamus. And the historical literature surrounding bilateral thalamotomies uh, concerns mainly RF thalamotomies, and that has been fraught with higher rates of speech, swallowing, dysarthria, and uh, balance difficulties. And so for a long time, uh, bilateral treatments have been kind of shied away from when, when you're talking about lesioning. Um, moving on to gamma knife, I want to just highlight gamma knife briefly. Uh, I think a lot of people might come into this thinking gamma knife and focus ultrasound are very similar, and in many respects they are. Uh, both of them use some form of you know radiation or, or thermal energy to transcranially lesion the VIM thalamus. Uh, both of them don't require an incision. Uh, both of them do require the use of a stereotactic frame. So in many ways, they're, they're somewhat similar. However, I see there's a couple differences that make gamma knife thalamotomy, in my eyes, inferior to focus ultrasound. And this would be namely how radiation works. Um, radiation takes a while to build up. And so you will have to wait anywhere from weeks to months to see any sort of clinical benefit. So you can see that highlighted on the far right column there, time course to clinical benefit. And thinking about that in kind of another you know, way, because of radiation and its latent efficacy, you cannot test intraoperatively to confirm that you are indeed in the VIM thalamus. I know that there are some uh, practitioners who do a sleep VIM DBS. Uh, I myself was trained to do it awake and continue to do that. And with DBS, uh, you know, you place the electrode, you hook it up to a temporary power source, you turn on the electricity, you test the patient awake to make sure that yes, their tremor is getting better, and yes, there's no significant side effects. So this, this act of kind of co confirming you're in the correct spot is very important, is a very important idea in movement disorder surgery. And we can do similar intraoperative testing with focused ultrasound, albeit kind of through completely different methods. Um, once patients are in the ultrasound uh, device and in the MRI scanner, we can slowly increase the level of thermal energy that we give, slowly heating up the VIM thalamus without ablating it. So this kind of gradual sublethal heating allows us to test intraoperatively that a patient's tremor is responding and it is decreasing without significant side effects. And once we've confirmed that, we can then give the ablative uh, ultrasound treatment. So with uh, gamma knife, you can't do that, right? You, uh, I don't want to say it, I don't want to sound too blasé, but it, it's a little bit of a shot in the dark, right? You measure where you feel VIM is going to be based on indirect targeting. I think tools like um, uh, tractography are very helpful to kind of hone in on where you think VIM might be. However, at the end of the day, you cannot kind of confirm to yourself you are in the correct spot. Um, this bilateral treatment thing, I, I did want to highlight uh, because, you know, when I was at Virginia, when we treat patients, uh, they would say, boy, you know, I'm, I'm doing really good. Can I, can I, when can I get my second hand treated? So this was something that we heard over and over and over again. And so we looked at this as like, well, well, how necessary is it to have your second hand treated? So this was a, a paper um, by my mentor, Jeff Elias, looking at uh, the kind of the, the power of just treating your dominant hand. So they compared uh, patients who underwent bilateral DBS, unilateral DBS, and unilateral focused ultrasound. And so they had several outcome measures. They looked at the CRST score. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll try to break it down for you. The CRST score is composed of three separate uh, groups. So part A is tremor, part B is TAS, part C is disability. So for part A, this is an objective measure of a patient's tremor. So you'll look at their you know, head, neck, voice tremor, right upper extremity, left upper extremity, right lower, left lower. So that by definition is a bilateral metric. 
For part B, the task portion, here you'll ask a patient to provide a handwriting sample. You'll also ask them to draw Archimedes spirals with both their right and left hand. You'll ask them to draw lines with both hands. You'll ask them to pour water with both hands. So this, again, by definition, is a bilateral metric. The disability subportion of the CRST score asks more general questions, such as how does the tremor affect your ability to speak, eat, drink, perform hygienic activities, dress yourself, uh, write, uh, does it interfere with your ability to work or do household chores? Does it cause social embarrassment? So these are much more, I would say, like real life events, right? I, I don't know how many of you on the day today are, are drawing Archimedes spirals in your free time, but I feel the ability to kind of feed or, you know, dress yourself is much more, you know, pertinent than drawing a, a spiral. And so when we look at the tremor and tasks uh, subportion, and recall these are bilateral metrics taking into account your right and left side. It shouldn't be a surprise that if you tr do a bilateral treatment, treating both hands, that you're gonna have better improvement in metrics that look at both your right and left hand. However, when we look at disability, like how you know, disabled are you in terms of you know, drinking coffee, eating your food, uh, you know, performing household chores, we find that if you treat your dominant hand, whether it be through DBS or focus ultrasound, if you get a good treatment, that your disability score isn't all that much different than bilateral DBS. And I think that's a very powerful message. Maybe suggest that uh, treating one hand is, is good enough. Uh, with that said, uh, patients would still routinely clamor about, uh, you know, I got my right hand treated. When can I get my left hand treated? And this has naturally led into uh, research looking at, well, can we do you know, staged bilateral ultrasound thalamotomies. You know, the technology from the, the old days of the RF thalamotomies has advanced. We have much more uh, accurate imaging in real time with MR and MR thermography. You know, there's thought, you know, can this be now safely done with 21st century technology? And so here were a couple of groups from uh, Japan, uh, Canada, and Spain that looked into this um, they spaced their ultrasound thalamotomies on the short end uh, by five months and the long end on tw 24 months or two years. And they reported a very good tremor uh, reduction in uh, CRST scores with, with uh, acceptable side effect profile. And so this led recently to uh, focused ultrasound receiving FDA approval for bilateral uh, thalamotomies in a staged manner. Um, this happened fairly recently in late uh, 2022 in December. And, and so this has been a, a, a little bit of a paradigm shift within the kind of the movement disorders surgery world. As I mentioned before, you know, lesioning techniques have long been kind of restricted to one side due to this historical data demonstrating, you know, higher rates of complication, at least with the ultrasound device so far those side effects seem significantly less than the traditional RF thalamotomy. So moving on from a, a central tremor, uh, what about Parkinson's disease? Um, Parkinson's disease, as you know, is not just tremor. Uh, there are other aspects to Parkinson's disease, such as you know, bradykinesia, rigidity, motor fluctuation, uh, dyskinesia. Uh, this top article looks at a specific subset of Parkinson's disease, which we call tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial by uh, one of my senior residents, Aaron, Aaron Bond. Uh, he demonstrated that uh, there are uh, significant improvements in response to a ultrasound thalamotomy for tremor dominant uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, patients who were uh, randomized to the treatment arm had a 62% improvement versus a 22% improvement in the sham patients. And that, that degree of improvement uh, kind of replicates the well-known placebo effect that we see with Parkinson's patients. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Parkinson's isn't just tremor. There are other symptoms uh, in Parkinson's. And so a couple years ago, uh, folks started looking into, well, can you, you know, treat the globus pallidus internus, the GPI? Can we, can we safely do a pallidotomy via ultrasound uh, 
uh, ablation. And this was recently just published. This was a, a randomized control trial of unilateral GPI um, pallidotomy for Parkinson's disease, primarily of symptoms of uh, motor uh, fluctuation and dyskinesia. And this mirrored kind of the, the study I, I showed you guys earlier with the essential tremor in which they randomized patients in a blinded manner. Here they had uh, 69 patients who were randomized to the treatment arm and 25 patients who were randomized to the sham arm. Their primary uh, metric was a three or more uh, improvement in the UPDRS motor or part three scores or in the off state or a three or more improvement in the unified dyskinesia rating scale in the on state at three months. And here they demonstrated that there was significant improvement in the treatment arm. 69% of the patients treated achieved their primary goal of a three or more improvement versus only 32% of the sham patients. So again, you see this uh, very, somewhat profound uh, placebo effect in Parkinson's, which has been well documented before. Um, after three months, they had a one year kind of open label period. Uh, notably, they had a fair amount of patients drop out or patients that didn't present for one year follow up. At one year, they had 39 patients and 30 of these had sustained clinical benefit at uh, 12 months. They did report side effects of dysarthria, uh, gait disturbance, uh, visual disturbance, and facial weakness. And so, you know, this is a uh, relatively recently uh, FDA-approved indication for Parkinson's disease. Um, as those, uh, as you might know, you know, GPI is just one target in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the subthalamic nucleus, or STN, is another very popular uh, target for neuromodulation in terms of DBS. Um, the historical literature be for lesioning the STN is perhaps not, not all that great. Um, there are reports of, you know, inducing motor uh, dyskinesia in the, in the form of hemibalismus. And so um, people did look at this for what it's worth. Um, they said, well, you know, can we revisit uh, subthalamotomy uh, with focused ultrasound? And the, the Spanish group published this uh, a couple years ago, um, kind of in the height of the first COVID winter. Um, they, again, randomized patients between focused ultrasound thalamotomy and sham. They had 27 that were randomized to treatment, 13 to the sham. Um, their primary outcome was a four-month UPDRS3 uh, score change in the off state. And so they demonstrated that in their treatment group, there was a 50% reduction in UPDRS3, and the sham only experienced an 8.5% reduction. Uh, for what it's worth, they did report uh, what I would, you know, tell you is not a small number of side effects. They uh, reported 22% of patients having dyskinesias, 19% of patients having some weakness, 56% uh, of patients having some sort of speech disturbance, and just under 50% with some sort of gait disturbance. Uh, with regards to the speech disturbance and the gait disturbance, they do go on to say that only one patient each had lasting side effects at one year. Um, this uh, did generate some, we'll say, controversy in the neurosurgical community. Um, this is an editorial published in Neurosurgery from um, Ron Alterman and, and Mike Schulder. Uh, I won't necessarily read it aloud for you, but you guys can, you know, f feel free to read it. They. Uh, they don't really mince words, and you know I think the take home is they're not particularly high on this uh, this treatment. Um, the the authors of the subthalamic paper, however, didn't want to necessarily take this line down. Uh, they came back and said, yes, we do have some side effects. However, most of them are what we would categorize as moderate or mild, and uh, only about less than five were present at 12 months. They do then go on to say in the last paragraph here, uh, you know, previously uh, Dr. Alterman provided pessimistic and gloomy opinions uh, and predictions regarding phosphatalmotomy, and you can you know read that for yourself. So I, I do think this is kind of interesting. At least speaks to the fact that people are using ultrasound in perhaps 
maybe not new ways, but novel ways, kind of revisiting things that in the past maybe weren't so deemed safe. Um, for what it's worth, subthalamotomy is not FDA approved. It's not something that, that we do here, but I do think it speaks to the fact that you know, people are using ultrasound for all these other different indications. And so that leads me to my final topic of conversation, which isn't necessarily movement disorders, but I would be remiss if I did not talk to you guys about kind of the non-movement disorder uh, realm of focused ultrasound. They are using focused ultrasound to investigate a whole host of conditions. Um, folks in the psychosurgery realm are doing anterior capsulotomies for OCD and epilepsy. Uh, people are looking at ablating hypothalamic hematomas. Uh, we know that the open surgery is, is very morbid for this. Uh, others are looking at ablating MTS. Uh, the group out of Switzerland has published some, some uh, nice results regarding neuropathic pain using medial thalamotomies. Uh, there is a theoretical use in the neurovascular space to kind of liquefy or sonothrombolyse ICHs to make them perhaps a little bit more amenable to uh, like a minimally invasive uh, evacuation. Those are what I would call lesional, perhaps sonothrombolytic uh, techniques in which you heat up tissue to basically burn it. Um, ultrasound, as you know, can be adjusted to image, you know, babies, right? And so depending on how you set up the parameters of ultrasound, it can also be used in a non-lesional manner. Well, we think of this as uh, low intensity or LIFU, uh, low intensity focused ultrasound. And so this has implications in uh, the neuro-oncology space where Folks are looking at disrupting the blood-brain barrier to aid with drug delivery, possible liquid biopsy, as well as uh, radio sensitization. And uh, finally, with regards to neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's dementia, uh, the concept of blood-brain barrier disruption uh, and then giving some sort of drug or antibody targeting neurofibrillary plaques and tangles has this idea of potentially being able to hasten or slow down the progression of that disease. And so here you have a nice graph kind of highlighting how you can, you know, change parameters of ultrasound to do various things. So you can ablate tissue, you can uh, use it to neuromodulate, that is kind of, you can use it to non-invasively do brain mapping, you can open the blood-brain barrier, obviously you can image things. And so just a brief aside about blood-brain barrier disruption, this is kind of a rough cartoon of how it works. You'll give someone a, a solution of microbubbles, sonicate them with a low-intensity focused ultrasound. The microbubbles will then oscillate and transiently open the blood-brain barrier, which you know the idea behind that is you know, they can aid with perhaps drug delivery. Um, this was looked at in uh, Canada where they uh, treated this patient, this patient had a craniotomy before, they treated this kind of uh, tumor resection border with focused ultrasound. You can see that blood-brain barrier disruption as denoted by the contrast extravasation, and then you can see that it resolves on post-operative day one. And so again, this has a lot of implications for drug delivery. You know, the blood-brain barrier is, is this kind of like immunoprivileged um, uh, structure that does limit the amount of uh, drug penetration. So I think this has very exciting possibilities moving forward. Um, in the interest of brevity, I'll kind of uh, just, just highlight the fact that a lot of this is happening at the University of Maryland where they're doing very nice work in this sphere. And then finally, uh, you know, I think this also has potential use in things like Alzheimer's dementia. So the idea behind this is that we can transiently disrupt the blood-brain barrier, give drugs that target these neurofibrillary plaques and tangles to potentially hasten or slow down the progression of Alzheimer's dementia. And so here you have a, a schematic of a pre-ultrasound immediately after ultrasound indicating you know, contrast extravasation and then uh, several days after ultrasound indicating that there's no damage. Um, this has been done uh, out at West Virginia and Cornell, in which they looked at uh, treating the mesial temporal structures. Um, this was more of a feasibility study. Um, it didn't actually show any sort of clinical benefit, but nonetheless does, you know, I think, uh, 
open up ultrasound to be used in these potentially very novel uh, applications. And so uh, to some, you know, ultrasound in its current iteration is very new. Uh, however, when we think about uh, kind of the whole scope of the neurosurgical canon, ultrasound has been around for a very long time, dating back to the 1950s. It only wasn't until probably around 20 years ago that technological advances have allowed for transcranial delivery of ultrasound without the need for a craniotomy. Uh, currently, it is FDA approved for a central tremor and Parkinson's disease in the form of a unilateral thalamotomy, bilateral stage thalamotomy, and then a unilateral palatotomy. And then as I just briefly touched on in the end, and I think you could devote you know, a whole nother hour or two just to the non-movement disorder sides of ultrasound, there are many potential uh, lesional and non-lesional uses for ultrasound. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Here's our contact and a picture of uh, Seattle to show you guys. It's not always rainy and gloomy here. Terrific. Uh, thanks so much, Tony. That was great. Um, can you just tell me a little bit more about the blood brain barrier disruption thing? So what's what is what the duration it looked like from that one trial was like 24 hours? Yeah, it's about 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 definitely not a transient or it's not a permanent thing. It, it's more of a, a temporary thing. So I think the idea is that you could, you know, disrupt it while the blood-brain barrier is open, give some sort of chemotherapeutic while this blood-brain barrier is open, and then it would, you know, a day later, revert back to normal. And, and what volume um, do we imagine that you could safely disrupt the blood-brain barrier? That's and, a great question. How much energy, you know, is required to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the thing with the blood-brain barrier disruption, it, it's its a, a LIFU thing, so it's not an ablative temperature. It's a, it's a much more lower intensity that doesn't right. rely on like thermal energy. It relies more on the mechanical force of the ultrasound wave itself. Um, insofar as, you know, how much you can treat, I don't think they've, you know, folks have looked at, you know, doing, you know, the whole hemisphere uh, disruption yet, but I assume as we learn more about that, that will be kind of, you know, people will try to do more and more. Yeah. And, and I mean, the setup for that, just in terms of thinking of this as, as a practical um, workflow sort of thing, you, you, you think of <laughs> Alzheimer's, uh, for example, or, you know, um, how long would it take to set up to do a blood-brain barrier disruption and then give the drug? And if it was a drug that needed to be given more than once, how, how much yeah, those, was really involved in this? Those, those, uh, those studies take several hours. They take more than an ablation treatment. I, I think with those procedures, one thing that, that would be beneficial is that you don't necessarily need to have them like awake for, for testing purposes which I think would make, you know, kind of at least from the patient perspective, it, it, a more tolerable thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily reasonable to have patients. You know, I think when we first started these uh, treatments, they were taking, you know, very long, you know, four hours because people were very, you know, tentative about slowly ramping up energy. Um, we do see patients that sometimes have a hard time just being awake in the device itself. For blood-brain barrier disruption, those tend to be longer than, say, a thermal ablation treatment. But because you don't need to necessarily test them for any sort of, you know, clinical effect, um, they could be, you know, sedated or, you know, even put to sleep or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the blood-brain barrier disruption thing is 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 a pretty big deal. It's sort of it's been a holy grail yeah. uh, thing. So, I mean, it does does have an enormous amount of potential if if you can really have an impact on the right drug for the right disease right. and uh, be effective. Um, do you have access to the chat there? Are there any questions in the chat? Uh, I, let me see if I can get out of this. I don't have, ex I don't see the chat up here at least. There was one question, Dr. Wong, um, early on, and it said, uh, and this is from Dr. Madeira. The technology used, where is it from? That was the one question I saw. 
Oh, the uh, the company itself, Insight Tech, they are based in in Israel. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, John. It's a great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, and I really appreciate the talk. Thanks right. so much.